Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. Um, I, these are my disclosures, which are those that I was initially in the Scientific Advisory Board of Okada and, and uh, involved in the studies that Dr. Gregori uh, mentioned previously, and also a consultant for two companies, Mesoblast and Angioblast, neither one of which is related to the topic of the talk that I'm going to give today. So today I'd like to talk to you about the generation of patient-specific cells for transplantation from individuals who have macular degeneration. Uh, so as you know from the a previous talk that uh, Dr. Gori gave, essentially RPE derived from human embryonic stem cells have already been implanted and shown to be uh, safe in a small clinical trial, phase one, phase two, in a limited number of individuals with age-related macular degeneration and Stargardt's disease. Now, the question of graft rejection, I think, is a very complicated one because we really don't understand fully uh, when you give patients unmatched cells what the uh, biology of the subretinal space is in the presence of disease. There's obviously some immune protection of the site, uh, but most of us think that cells will be rejected if they're put into a compromised subretinal environment. And whether or not the um, immune suppression levels that are given in the clinical trials are even sufficient to prevent this, in my view, is actually really not known. So the purpose of this study really is to look at the practical aspects of whether we can generate uh, retinal pigment epithelial cells starting from skin of older patients that have macular degeneration. Um, because as you know, people who have macular degeneration are often in their 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s. And whether or not you can do this and whether the cells will work, I think is, is not such an obvious thing. So induced pluripotential stem cells in this study are essentially generated from skin biopsies. The skin biopsies are taken from the uh, axillary region or armpit. We did this on purpose uh, to avoid taking cells that have been exposed to light over the course of a patient's lifetime. And essentially these, are these uh, skin cells are reprogrammed into induced pluripotential stem cells differentiated toward pigment epithelium with the goal of putting them back into patients. And at this point, uh, they have not been put back into a patient in our hands, although two patients have been um, enrolled in a clinical trial in Japan. So the questions we're going to ask is, can we use iPS cells as a cell source? So you know geographic atrophy affects older patients with macular degeneration. The first question is, if you have a large cohort of patients, can you actually generate iPS cells in an efficient fashion? from these individuals. The second question is, once you have induced pluripotential stem cells, can you actually turn these into pigment epithelium? And then the third question, which I think is extremely important, is will these pigment epithelial cells function normally? So we obtained skin biopsies from patients with age-related macular degenerations and other disorders. Uh, we obtained a total of 33 skin biopsies from these patients that was approved by the IRB. And as you can see, the patients actually had a mixture of diseases. And for the purpose of this study, I'm really going to focus on uh, dry macular degeneration and wet macular degeneration and their age match control. We also have a limited number of samples of other diseases, including Best disease, Stargardt's disease, retinitis, pigmentosa, et cetera, that I'm really not going to discuss uh, further today. So this shows that the age match controls, actually we tried to make them the exact same age, uh, but the age match controls were largely patients coming in for routine cataract surgery without a retinal degeneration or glaucoma, and they were slightly younger than the AMD patients, uh, unfortunately, uh, by about five to seven years. And uh, we don't think this is a significant difference, but there was a difference nonetheless between the two populations. Um, this is a chi-squared analysis, essentially showing that um, we were able to, that there's no difference in the distribution of males and females between the controls, dry AMD and uh, wet AMD. And this sort of shows what the technique is, which Dr. Adelman already alluded to. Essentially, we reprogram fibroblasts from skin uh, by using sendivirus reprogramming and using four transcription factors uh, for which um, uh, Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize in 2008, and those are OCT3 and 4, um, CMIC, SOX2, and then KLF4. Uh, and these essentially factors are sufficient to induce pluripotential uh, stem cells from pretty much any human tissue body uh, of the body, and uh, we use uh, skin fibroblasts because they grow quickly and are relatively obtained uh, by a non, you know, minimally invasive biopsy. So this essentially shows that fibroblasts from AMD patients and controls can be turned into iPS cells. So when we did this, we essentially were looking for uh, markers of pluripotency, and these markers include OCT4, uh, NANIG, SOX2, and then TRA160. And you can see across the top panel, essentially, that we were able to turn these cells into iPS. And qualitatively, there was really no difference in the staining that we could discern, uh, depending on the, the disease status of the host. It did not matter if the patients had macular degeneration 
separation or not. The lower row shows uh, the nuclei stained with uh, DAPI. The efficacy of reprogramming was a little bit higher in the controls, but this was not statistically significant. So this is the, our ability to reprogram cells into iPS cells with one attempt. Uh, the, the reality is that if we were not successful with one attempt, we were usually successful with a second attempt. And essentially, we were able to generate iPS cells in five out of five controls on the first attempt, uh, six out of the eight geographic atrophy, and five out of the six white AMD. It looks like it's a little harder to do this in the AMDIs, but the p-value is greater than 0.05 using a chi-squared. This is not statistically significant. Um, this sort of shows that the cells look like at different stages. So on the upper left-hand panel uh, is our, our uh, IPS cells. I guess you don't see, do you see the mouse? Yeah, you yes. see the mouse. Yeah, on the upper left-hand panel are, uh, is an IPS cell um, colony. These are then turned into embryoid bodies. The embryoid bodies can then be uh, differentiated uh, toward uh, pigment epithelium derived from the IPS cells, or they can uh, be differentiated to neural ros rosette toward photoreceptors, but for the purpose of this talk, we're really talking about IPS-derived retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, RP cells generated from these uh, give these uh, nice patches, which I showed uh, just a moment ago. You can actually see them in a, in a tissue culture dish and, and harvest them. These are extremely pure colonies. Essentially, when we stain them for RP markers, uh, these are virtually 100% stains for pigment epithelial cell markers. And the markers that I'm showing you here including, uh, include proteins that are ordinarily expressed by RP. They include uh, junctional proteins like uh, ZO1, uh, CRALBP, uh, Bestrophin, and um, uh, you can see an Ezrin. It's a little hard for me to see it on the monitor here, but on the XY projection, you can sort of see that these are located about where you'd expect them to in respect to the apical-basal dimension of the cell and that they're easily seen on, uh, on immunoblots of the um, <clears throat> samples. So the next thing we did is to determine whether or not these cells can actually function like pigment epithelium. And uh, the first test that we did, we did about four different tests. And the first thing we did is we actually took these iPS cells and fed them, and fed them um, labeled uh, outer segments, uh, which were bovine outer segments. We did a smaller study with human outer segments, which are harder to obtain from autopsy eyes. The outer segments were labeled with fluorescein. Uh, so this shows ZO1 staining, which shows you the border of the cells. And then the green is the labeled outer segment. And when we quantified this, essentially there was no difference in AMD eyes versus control eyes and their ability to ingest outer segments. Uh, this looks at, the, at something else, which is the, the apical basal polarity. As you know, pigment epithelial cells are polarized. Uh, so we put the cells onto, uh, we generated RP basin membrane, then culture these cells on basin membrane, and then put them into a tissue culture dish. So essentially there were two compartments, an apical compartment and then a bottom basal compartment. And as you know, in vivo, in human eye in vivo, RP cells uh, release VEGF in a polarized fashion. The levels of VEGF are higher on the basal side than they are on the apical side. Similar PEDF is the opposite, with the, the level being higher on the apical side than on the basal side. And this is what we saw in, in tissue culture, that essentially these cells pretty much recapitulate that um, difference between the apical and basal side. When you looked at VEGF released from these IPS-derived RPE, that there are higher levels of VEGF being released basally, and higher levels of PEDF which are being released apically, as you would expect. The last thing that we measured is the transepithelial resistance. So RP monolayers, when they become um, mature, there are tight junctions between the cells. You can put an electrode on each side of that and es essentially measure the transepithelial resistance. And we saw no difference in transepithelial resistance, which is measured in ohms per centimeter squared in RP derived from a, a young individual, from an age match control, or from an AMD individual. In conclusion, this is the last slide. Patient-derived fibroblasts can be pre-programmed into iPS cells. We saw no decline uh, or no difference between dry AMD, wet AMD, and controls. We had a small number of young eyes, and they seemed to be uh, generated at this, about the same rate. So we didn't see any obvious decrease in the ability to do this as the patients get older or have disease. The iPS cells can be differentiated toward R RPE uh, cells. They express all the RP markers that we've looked for without exception. They ingest outer segments, they form intact barriers, and they release VEGF and PEDF in a polarized fashion. Uh, in my view, these cells may be useful for two purposes. The obvious uh, therapeutic purpose is cell replacement therapy. But in addition to this, we have cells essentially which are harvested from AMD individuals and their controls. The genetics are from AMD patients. Epigenetics are from AMD patients. And this allows us to study macular degeneration in addition in a way that we can't currently do uh, with our animal models. Thank you.
I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Mark Fields, Wei Kai, Jay Gong, and Ernesto Moria. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Del Peyori. If there is a question from audience, please come to the microphone. To start with, I have a question for Dr. Del Peyori. Would you mind uh, commenting on regulatory pathways for these cells? Uh, so I think the regulatory pathway for this sort of uh, treatment is actually very complex. Uh, the regulatory pathway for embryonic stem cells, where they've been studied in the laboratory for 20 years and have gone through all sorts of safety testing in animal models is much cleaner, and that's why those have already moved into humans. I think for this, we're really going to be dealing with individual cell lines, which are, uh, which are going to have to be approved by either the European or the, or the um, uh, U.S. equivalent of the uh, Food and Drug Administration. And uh, I think it's going to be a little complicated. And I will say that um, recently in the U.S. there was an approval of a, uh, manipula a genetic manipulation in patients and a patient that had lymphoma where the cells were taken out, or leukemia, it was a child with leukemia lymphoma, where the cells were taken out, the gene defect was corrected and put back into the patient. So I think the regulatory agencies are going to start thinking in that direction. But right now I think it's still a bit of a hurdle. Thank you. Any question from audience? Yes. Uh, Richard? Yes. Uh, have you noticed a uh, change uh, in the blood corridor blood flow uh, concerning these uh, new cells? Um, so, so the cells, uh, you asked about whether there's a difference in blood flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have, we have not put these cells back into um, patients or into the relevant animal model of macular degeneration. So I can't really comment on what they would do with, with blood flow. I can tell you that they release VEGF, which I think is one of the main factors involved in maintaining the choroidal vasculature at about the right concentration, and, and the polarization difference between top and bottom is about the right order, is about the right size too. But I don't know what they would do in vivo with blood flow. Okay, because in embryonic cells, uh, the new cells induce vascularization and needs. So uh, I want to know that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next session is diabetic retina. Oh, you have a question. One Please question. go ahead. Um, when you, uh, for Dr. Del Piero, when how long does it take to go from taking the fibroblasts from the um, skin to having them ready to potentially use in the trial? Um, so the actual period of time between harvesting a skin biopsy and having uh, functional RP cells is probably about 12 to 16 weeks, I would say. We're trying to get that number down a little bit. And there are some practical ways that you can decrease it, but in our hands, it's about 12 to 16 weeks. So for a patient with dry AMD, I don't think that this is an issue because their disease is very slowly evolving. If you think about applying this to wet AMD, uh, I guess you'd be treating uh, anti-VEGF non-responders at this point. It might not be an issue either, but it's, it's definitely a slow process. I thought it was going to be longer. I thought you were going to say six months, so I'm surprised yeah. it was so short. <laughs>